Signore e signori, sale sul palco Salim Ismail. Good morning. And th th thank you for the extraordinary speech. And I think there's some two or three concepts in there that I think are really relevant for where the world is going. I apologize, I'm speaking in English, uh, but if, you, if I spoke in Italian, you would run screaming from the room, so much safer if, uh, if I stay this way. Um, uh, I, my background, I've been building out this organization called Singularity University for the last six years. Uh, before this, I was the head of innovation at Yahoo. Uh, I spent 10 years here in Europe restructuring large European companies, mostly mostly French companies, which is why I'm bold, and I think if you've talked to French companies, you'll understand that. Uh, and we're seeing over the last few years, and I found out that large organizations and large companies have a major structural issue in this next 10 or 20 years. Now, the big structural issue is they are all built to scale, and they're built on predictability, and they're built on efficiency. But we're entering a world where the world is not run by predictability, We are entering a disruptive and an innovative world, and we need to adapt our organization structures to this new world. Large organizations are now, for this next 10 or 20 years, under major threat as we go forward. Um, the Singularity University, this organization we've been building, is based at NASA in Silicon Valley. We got initial funding from Google, Cisco, Nokia, Autodesk to get started, and we live off this particular curve. This is a curve on a logarithmic y-axis of the price performance of computing. Many of you are familiar with uh, Moore's law, the idea that we double the computation power every 18 months. And from the 1960s, we've been seeing very steadily how extraordinarily this computation power has been doubling. This smartphone has in it more computational power in this than the entire U.S. government had in the 1980s. Right? That's what we're dealing with today. Uh, we've seen 40% annual growth in desktop computing speeds over the last 30, 40 years. If the top speed of a car had increased at that same 40% annual rate, a car today would go faster than the speed of light. Right? So give you some sense of what we're living. And so we're seeing this extraordinary pace of change, and it's not stopping it's actually accelerating. Because we use faster computers to design faster computers, and the pace continues. Uh, and we're seeing now, uniquely, for the first time in the history of humanity, not just one technology move this quickly, but seven or eight technologies move this quickly. And we're seeing now artificial intelligence, robotics, biotechnology, bioinformatics, synthetic biology, 3D printing, Uh, even energy move at this doubling pattern, all doubling in their capability about one to two years, each of them. Right? Uh, five and a half years ago, we brought together 50 or 60 thought leaders from around Silicon Valley, and we asked the question, is it worth creating an educational institution only focused on these accelerating technologies? And we created them, we've brought together many of the world's leading experts in these areas. Vint Cerf, who created the IP address system, Craig Venter, who sequenced the first human genome. And each of them at the edges of their fields is seeing this extraordinary disruption. We challenge our students to learn about these technologies, and the challenge we give them is go create a company, create a product, create a service. Go impact a billion people positively within 10 years. That's the challenge we lay to them. And so at the end of every summer when we do our programs, we launch companies, NGOs, for-profit initiatives aiming to each impact a billion people by harnessing the acceleration in these technologies. One example, this team was looking at poverty from a couple of years ago, and they noticed that in Africa, all of the roads get washed out during the wet season. 85% of all the roads disappear. And how do you alleviate poverty if you can't move anything around? Chris Anderson, the head of Wired magazine, came and did a talk on drones, and you're all familiar with these quadcopter things. Uh, and they noticed that these drones are actually doubling in their capability very steadily. And so they had the idea, why not use drones to move medicine and food around? This was three years ago. This is a live test from Haiti, where they're delivering medicine to a, a camp. And what's interesting about these drones is today, a, a drone can carry a two-kilo package 
about 10 kilometers. But the underlying technologies are moving so fast that they're doubling in their capability every nine months. So by the end of this year, four kilos, by the middle of next year, eight kilos, and now things get very interesting. Right? We've already had a phone call from FedEx saying, hey, what are you doing over there? Um, and you may have seen this announcement from, uh, from Amazon where they want to deliver packages using drones. Right? Uh, by the way, this was a fake. They have no such capability. But they managed to get the story out on American television the day before Cyber Monday, the biggest shopping day of the year. Uh, we love it because it actually gives legitimacy to the idea. So we do our a program every summer aiming for that. We also do one-week executive programs for CEOs, investors, government leaders. Maybe the most interesting attribute of our model is that because we're focused on such fast-moving technologies, we have to update our curriculum very frequently. So about five or six times a year, we actually convene our whole faculty and we revisit every lecture. Because in biotech, we've had four major breakthroughs just in the last year. All of these technologies are moving so fast. So that, I wanted to give you some sense of what we do. And let me cover where this is going, because I think the implications of this are more the more interesting part. This pace of change is quite extraordinary. We've never seen this in humanity, right? this pace of computational change. And this is the best analogy that I we found to describe this. Some of you are old enough to remember film photography, right? A few of you here and there. Um, when you're operating from film photography, you're operating from a material basis, a chemical image on a film. And it costs about a, a euro a photograph for the film and the processing. We operate from a scarcity model. You can only carry so much film around. We frame every shot carefully. When you move to digital photography and you change the substrate from a physical one to a digital one, two things happen. The first thing is the marginal cost of an extra photograph goes to zero. Now you can take a thousand more photographs for no extra cost, and we do. And the second is the domain explodes because of that cost. In 1996, there were about 750 million film photographs processed around the world that year. Today, per day, we are uploading 750 million photographs up to Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, etc. Right? Whether you agree with that or not, the domain has exploded. Right? And this explosion, when you go from the material world to the digital world, is essentially what we're seeing across all of these technologies. And of course, once you have something in an information-based environment, you can apply machine learning, artificial intelligence, simulations, modeling, correlations, and that drives the pace of change even faster. And when you add up that computational power and you information enable the world, note that we are turning the world into information, right? My memory is not in my head anymore, it's in my smartphone. Our relationships, because of social networks, our relationships are all digital, not analog. Our communications are all digital. If you're below 30 years old, the appearance of your Facebook profile is much more important than how you're dressed that day, right? And we can tell by how they're dressing these days that that's really true. And so we're seeing this extraordinary change. And once you turn something into an information paradigm, it hops on that doubling pattern and it takes off. And it goes to this uh, mode of explosion from material to digital photography. 3D printing, many of you are familiar with, this is going through this explosion. And there are two inflection points in 3D printing that are important. The first is that you can make things like the ball on the top right that cannot be molded. You can actually make that with a 3D printer. You have to assemble it in a traditional way, but a 3D printer can put that out. The second and more important part of 3D printing is that it's always been true in manufacturing that a more complex object costs more the design, the fabrication techniques, the materials. But for the first time in history, in manufacturing, complexity is free. The 3D printer does not care if I'm doing the yellow thing in the middle or one of the more complex objects around the side in the same way that your inkjet printer does not care if you're printing one letter or a complex image. It's just throwing out the ink. And so these two inflection points, and we're seeing these same inflection points across all of these technologies. In robotics, you're all familiar with these toy helicopters that all the kids are playing with, right? That's $20 today. Four years ago, that $20 helicopter cost $700. Eight years ago, it was not possible. 
It was not possible to have that level of miniaturization, servo motors, stabilizers. Now it's $20. And when it's $20, it means that many more people can play around with it, hack at it, do interesting things with it. These are two drones that are throwing a pole up and down. One is throwing up the pole and the other one is catching it in real time. You could not control that drone yourself in that way, right? And so this is what's capable today with these drones. Extraordinary level of sophistication. How many of you are familiar with the Google car? Can I just say show events? Right, many of you. So Google has created a car that drives itself with no driver. Um, it uses laser radar to navigate its surroundings. This is a video of it going through Palo Alto streets and you can see the LiDAR unit at the top. It can navigate stop signs, traffic lights, pedestrians, uh, etc. cetera, um, safety hazards. I'm sure Google uh, thanked these pedestrians for participating in the research. They have no idea the car has no driver, um, and so on. Here's what's unbelievable about this car. It has already done more than a million kilometers on California streets and highways without an accident. Most of us could not drive a million kilometers without an accident, right? <laughs> Especially here in Italy, okay? And we thought, we thought that, okay, the car is ready, because to, to have an autonomous car, you don't need artificial human intelligence, you need artificial horse intelligence. And we have that, right? And we thought, okay, the car is ready, but it will take a long time to get authorization from a Department of Motor Vehicles for the government to authorize it. And then two years ago, the state of Nevada authorized autonomous vehicles. And we thought, okay, it's Nevada. They'll authorize anything in Nevada, right? <laughs> but now California, Florida, because of all the senior citizens have authorized it. Six states have done this, and this is moving very quickly. Most people think this car is about 10 to 15 years away. We think it's three to five years away. And so within a few years, we will have autonomous vehicles. And we estimate that the capacity of existing roads and highways around the world, existing capacity with no change to infrastructure, will have 10 or 15 times more, traffic, more humans going down a street than we do today. I know that Rome, Italy has no traffic issues, but in many parts of the world, this is a big problem, right? And what happens when we do this? It means that real estate values start smoothing out where they're spiking heavily in the middle of cities. I have a three-year-old son. He will never learn how to drive. Right? This may have the biggest change in society that we see in our lifetimes, and it's happening right now. And we, we were tracking maybe 30 or 40 of these extraordinary changes. In the U.S., 2.5% of GDP is just the cost of accidents. Just the cost of accidents. And we kill a million people around the world a year with cars. And when you can release that back to the general economy, quite extraordinary. You may have seen this announcement this week from Google, obviously copying the Fiat, uh, where they've announced this car that has no steering wheel in it. Right? I'll cover two more technologies to give you some sense of this. Biotechnology, 50 years ago, we found the human genome when we discovered that life is actually information-based. A, T, C, and G are the four core molecules of DNA, and you assemble that in interesting ways, and you get all of the diversity that we have in life. And we're learning the language of biology over this last few decades. When you learn a new language, you go through three phases. You learn how to read, then we do comprehension, and then we do writing, right? We have now learned how to read DNA extremely well. Twelve years ago, we sequenced the first human genome. It cost $2.7 billion to sequence the first human genome 12 years ago. The second one cost about $400 million. Third one was about $50 million. Fourth one was about $14 million. Does anybody know what it is today? It's $1,000. We've gone from $2.7 billion to $1,000 in 12 years. In two years, it will be $100 to sequence the human genome. By the end of this decade, it will cost a penny. By 2020, it will be cheaper to sequence your genome than it will be to flush your toilet. And when you flush your toilet, we'll probably sequence everything that goes through there because it will be an interesting thing to do, right? This is extraordinary. Well, thank you. We did a workshop with the mayor of Barcelona a few months ago, and he had the idea, why not put gene sequencers on all the sewage coming out of the city so you could see what illnesses were happening across the city? Interesting idea. Right? Now we're learning how to do the comprehension side. If you have perfect pitch and music as a singer, that's actually governed by a single gene. If you have a heart attack, 
and you have a particular gene, you need a triple dosage of the drug that will thin your blood. And so you can wear a dog tag that wears it. So we're now starting to understand, because your DNA is the software that runs each of the 10 trillion cells in your body. Now we're starting to learn how to write. This is the uh, team, there's a team working on recreating the woolly mammoth. We are about two years away from a live woolly mammoth wandering around. It will be a little confused. Its habitat will have changed quite considerably. Um, but this is quite scary stuff, right? It has extraordinary implications for ethics and conservations. We mentioned ethics this morning. We, the giant panda is alive today and not extinct because it looks cute. Is that the right thing to do or not? Right? And so we'll have to deal with these. This is a photograph from the iGEM competition. Teams of college students are getting together to hack DNA and synthesize life forms in new ways. And they have a contest to see who can have the most creative use of this. A team, the winning team from two years ago took resveratrol, the cancer-fighting substance in red wine, crossed it with yeast, started brewing beer with the yeast, and you can now buy cancer-fighting beer. Okay? This team took phosphorus, the glow-in-the-dark substance, crossed it with the DNA of a cat, and you can buy a pet that glows in the dark. Right? The cat is not very happy about it, it can't hide anymore. Right? Extraordinary what you can do. And you can now do this in your bedroom because the cost is so inexpensive. This is a photograph in an open source hacker space where you can synthesize DNA and learn how to do it. The girl in the middle there is eight years old and she's leading the class. It turns out she's really good at it. She knows how to hold a pipette at the right angle. She's teaching the adults how to do this. She's manipulating life at the age of eight years old. Right? And we talked about ethics. How will we deal with the ethics around this? And part of the reason that we exist is these technologies are billions of times more powerful than when we were young. And so the negative outcomes, accidental or deliberate, are quite profound. Right? My three-year-old, I grew up hacking PCs. Many of the kids today are hacking the internet. My three-year-old will be hacking the family dog. Right? Or me, if, if I'm not careful. So we have to really think about where this is going. This is an artist who can take a cigarette butt and by analyzing the DNA on the cigarette can recreate the face of the person that smoked it. And there's a, this is her creating a picture of herself, and there's a whole company that's created that creates mugshots for the police based on DNA found at crime scenes. I'm sure the NSA is all over this in, in the U.S., right? Um, and when you cross 3D printing with biotech, you have companies like this where you can 3D print a human organ. We are about two and a half years away from having working models of kidneys, livers, etc., Today, we can already 3D print heart valves, tracheas, nose bridges, jaw bones. We're moving now to more complex organs, right? So if you drink too much, you print a new liver. <laughs> right? um, and thank you. I've drunk a lot of Italian wine. My, my liver still hurts. This is the inflection point four years ago that triggered it all off. Craig Venter, who sequenced the first human genome, did this. He sequenced a bacteria, about a million base pairs, uh, modified it to his own specifications, replaced the DNA of an existing bacteria. And since that time, we have, for the first time in the history of the world, a self-replicating life form, and its parent DNA is an email file. That's an inflection point. The world will never be the same again. Right? And we're seeing that same level of disruption. This is essentially the movement from the film photography to digital photography. And we are now in a world of digital biology. Life is now modeled and created on a designer basis, not from an evolutionary basis. This is a company, one of our companies, that noticed that we use 70 billion farm animals around the world for meat processing. If the middle class grows as expected, we will need another 50 billion farm animals within the next 20 years, and just that could destroy the climate. So they are 3D printing beef in a petri dish, as opposed to hacking it out of a cow. Right? Now, it tastes terrible today. We've tasted this, the beef uh, grown in a lab, but our joke is the taste is doubling every year, so we'll see how that works out. Um, but you can see the implications of this. Right? Today, they're growing leather, which actually can, they can grow perfect leather, which has no flaws in it. And the cow is happier too. Okay? Um, 
I'll touch on one more technology to give you some sense of where this is going. This is neuroscience. We have this old view of the brain that we simply, we thought we don't, really don't have much idea of what's happening in the brain, but today you can actually spot a single neuron firing in your brain in real time. And what that gives us for the first time ever, the inflection point here, is we actually have a feedback loop. So if my brain does something, I can actually see what, what affected it. And what happens when you take all of these technologies and apply it to this organ that we still don't know fundamentally how it works? We still don't know why we sleep, for example. We have no idea, right? This is how we used to try and read the brain, a very awkward-looking thing. And now we have this fairly elegant, but not so great so yet, device that will tell you what brain level brainwave levels you have in your head. And you can buy today about a $100 headset that will give you a pretty, good, pretty accurate sense of what frequency of brainwaves you have. This device here, created by Stephen Philip Lowe, is used by Stephen Hawking, the physicist. He thinks of the word, of word, the device detects the word and speaks it for him. Right? And so we're in fairly extensive mind reading capability. This is a team from Japan where you lie down and you go to sleep in an MRI machine and they are literally taking the images off your visual cortex and storing them. Their objective is to play your dreams back to you the next day. Okay? My wife wants to get her hands on that. I'm <laughs> not so happy about my wife getting her hands on this, right? How will we deal with this? So I, I, I don't have time to go through all of these technologies, but I encourage you to look these up. Because each of them is going through that same inflection point from digital photography to, from film photography that we've seen, each of these is literally exploding as we speak. Okay? Um, because the technologies are being very disruptive, and they're all very sexy, right? Front page news, the Google car, cute videos, etc. But fundamentally, we are not set up for this. All of the mechanisms that we use to run society, our civics, our politics, our legal systems, healthcare, education, intellectual property, you name it, all designed for a world a few hundred years ago, right? Not for the world of today. And definitely not for where the world is going. I've shown, I played you the polite version of the, uh, the Google car. This is a YouTube video of what it's like to actually drive in the Google car. So if I could get a bit of volume for this, let's see what this sounds like. The Hans team will never believe this. Oh thing. my goodness. There's a little Go swearing in this, so just bear with me. Again. Holy shit. Holy shit. There's no fucking hands on that wheel. Apologies. Oh my god. <laughs> what? It's driving itself. <laughs> ah! Ah! All right, you, you, you got the general idea. <laughs> that is the. That is the. That scream. Do not forget that scream. That's the primal scream of humanity meeting advanced technology. Right? And when you get into that car for the first time and it takes off through the obstacle course and it's driving the obstacle course faster than you could drive it yourself and there's nobody in the driver's seat, you freak out, right? And now after about driving it for 10 minutes, it's like getting into an elevator. You press a button, it takes you to the floor you want to go. But the first reaction is a freak out reaction. What's happening around the world today is that we are freaking out because of this information paradigm. The Arab Spring. The younger generation is using information in a way that the older generation can't conceive of, and that's causing a lot of stress. This is the Prime Minister of Turkey from a few months ago. A smart, intelligent, thoughtful, experienced guy making a ridiculous comment about technology. This is his scream, right? The US using old structures to try and address new problems. It simply does not work to try and do this this way. This is the Fourth Amendment in the US Constitution, the right to privacy. Has, we've been showing this image for six years in America, saying we're headed to a point where technology destroys the right to privacy. Now we're there. It's gone in the U.S. A fundamental pillar of American society has disappeared with no public conversation about it. Right? I'm Canadian. I don't have an expectation of privacy anyway. <laughs> but if you're American, this is a pretty bad place to be. And you can't update the Constitution in the current political environment. I mentioned our curriculum planning meetings. Even though we have the, uh, uh, the smartest thought leaders, researchers, uh, world experts, we can't become an official accredited state-sanctioned university because to do that, you have to fix your curriculum and not change it. And we update our curriculum by necessity. And it brings about the general question of how does any regulatory framework 
keep pace as technology is accelerating away from us. Right? And the last part of this is that we, it used to take a long time to create a billion dollar company, moving into the economic and the business side of things. Google took about eight years, Facebook took five years, Grand Theft Auto, three days to a billion dollars. Right? Three days. Unbelievable, never been seen before. And all new business models are information-based. Google 10 years ago was a joke. Nobody knew how they would make money. Today it's a $300 billion company, essentially by manipulating text and video. Right? Facebook, $160 billion company, just by digitizing our relationships. And we're getting into all of the billions and trillions of sensors out there. And old industries are being decimated. As once we information enable an industry, we see huge deflationary dynamics, about a 10x drop in revenues in newspapers or publishing or music. Right? And here's how badly we get it wrong. We've seen over the last 10 years exponential growth in mobile phones, going from 100 million, doubling every two years to almost 7 billion out there. This is Vinod Kosla, one of our faculty. He looked at what did the industry experts and the mobile, the mobile phone industry experts, how do they predict this pace of change? And he found that every point during this exponential curve, the experts in any field project linearly. So in 2002, they predicted 16%. There was, there, it actually was 100%. 2004, 14%. Then it doubled again, 100%. 2006, 12%. Doubled again, 100%. In 2008, the world's leading expert mobile phone analyst predicted 10% growth in mobile phones, and it went up 100%. How much wrong, more wrong can you be from 10% to 100%? Right? Because we human beings are not good at this exponential curve. All of our intuition is, is geared towards tr looking linearly. And we, if I take 30 steps, I will go 30 meters, and you can predict very well where am I one-third of the way, two-thirds of the way. If I take 30 doubling steps, and I double at every step, 2, 4, 8, 16, at step 30, I'm at a billion. I'm 26 times around the world, which is a little further than the back of the room. Right? And it's hard to predict where that's going. And the last part of this, which is maybe the most exciting, is that because of these technologies, the cost is dropping, is democratizing access to these technologies. So a farmer in Africa with a smartphone has more information capability in his hands than Clinton did when he was president. That's a profound thing to be able to say. It means every one of you has access to these technologies in a way that only big companies or governments had access a few years ago. This is a, a woman from Harvard who's created a 3D printer that will print makeup. So you print makeup at home and you don't need to spend money with cosmetics companies. Right? Entre very disruptive. This is a 10-person lab out of LA who've solved the superbug problem. We have bacteria that are antibiotic resistant. We've never had that before. And they've solved for this. And a, sec a side effect of what they've done is they can cure all allergies. And there are 10 people out of LA. This is Jack Andreka. How many of you are familiar with this fellow? 14 year old kid has solved pancreatic cancer. And he did it by searching Google. Okay? A 14 year old kid solved, early, created an early stage discovery for pancreatic cancer by searching Google. You can't make this up, right? This is his Wikipedia entry. Researcher, cancer researcher, scientist, born 1997, right? It's really embarrassing. When I was 14 years old, I was not doing this. This is one of our alumni, Emiliano Cargiman. He's been voted by our faculty the most likely to actually impact a billion people. He's designed nanosatellites that are about this big. Once you have a float, a mesh cluster of these up into space, he will be able to provide real-time video, real-time video anywhere on Earth to a one-meter resolution. His first two satellites have already launched. His full cost for doing this will be about $200 million. Right? Not billions, not anything like that. Real-time video. And he'll open up an app store capability for this. This is Will Henshaw. This is my, uh, me wearing a headset and my brain. This is a fellow called Will Henshaw. He was a guitarist for the Eurythmics, the band from the 1980s. And he's composing music that when you put your... Uh, this headset on and you listen to music, your brain goes into a focused alpha state and you can now work on design, software development, coding, and it puts your brain into a focused state, you're in the zone. Right? This is a billion dollar idea. Right? And he's doing this with a Mac and a hundred dollar headset. We had the CEO of Illy Coffee 
at one of our programs, and he said, wait a minute, that's pretty threatening to me. People will drink less coffee. Have this, right? He's right. And so this is what's possible. And I, and I want to end with why startups, why entrepreneurs and why startups. We did this study with the Kauffman Foundation in the U.S., and we found that over the last 40 years in the U.S., 100% of all new jobs have come from startups. Large companies have created in the last 40 years exactly zero new jobs. And in a world where we desperately need new jobs, startups are the only place to go. Right? And so the, literally the economy of not just Italy, but the entire world depends on entrepreneurship. And you need to be crazy to be an entrepreneur. All of you are pretty crazy. You're Italian, so you're crazy by default, <laughs> but you have to be it's crazy anyway. Right? And here's how I think about entrepreneurship. You use technology and passion to solve a problem. This is the European Union definition of entrepreneurship. And you want to know why Europe is a mess? That's how they look at entrepreneurship. Okay? It really is too, does not have to be harder than this. And this is, a better time, this is a better time to build a startup than the history of the world. You have crowdfunding, you have maker movements, the democratization of technology, and this incredible inflection point. Because as the world moves to this new modality, we are changing the modality of the world from a money-based environment to an information-based environment. And that represents enormous disruption. From a business perspective, you have disruption, you have opportunity. And so we will have extraordinary new money coming into the system because of this, and very good understanding of how to go about building a new ecosystem around this. And the final thing you need if you want to build a company is passion. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Italians have quite a lot of passion. I'm Canadian, not a lot of passion in Canada. Right? Um, I'll skip this, but basically, let me end on this. The rate of change is not slowing down. It's actually increasing. If this was a true exponential, it would be linear. It's actually curving upwards. About 10 years ago, we had about 400 million connected devices on the internet. Today, we have 8 billion connected devices on the internet. By 2020, we're going to have 50 billion connected devices on the internet. Shortly thereafter, we're going to go to a trillion. We're going to go from 8 billion today to a trillion within our careers, right? We think we're 30, 40 years into the information revolution. On this metric, we're about 1% of the way there. We're just starting. And we had 1.2 billion people online in 2010. We're now moving to 5 billion people online and by 2020. The biggest market in the history of humanity is 3 trillion new minds coming online in the next three years. And they're all going to have one of these. This is the new Indian Akash tablet. It's a 1 gig Android tablet with a camera, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. It's a phone. It's 20 euros. It's dropping in price 50% a year. In about three or four years, we will be giving these out in cereal boxes because you won't be able to sell anything to those five billion people without one of these, right? That's how fast. Three billion people with access to all of this. And why Italy? 500 years ago, we had the Renaissance, a rebirth. And here in Italy, we changed the modality of the world to where we are today, right? You are responsible, and thank God it happened, because of the type of thinking you had here in this country, we reoriented the whole world over the last 500 years. We are at a point today... Thank you. We are at a point today where we need to reorient the world again. And to do that, you need technology, you need design, you need passion, you need vision. And you have all of those things here. And so I would actually call on you, like da Vinci, the original interdisciplinary technology genius looking at accelerating technologies, I'd actually call on you here today to create a second renaissance, to bridge into this new world, because we need to re-architect the entire world in every single aspect of how we do it, and it will need the kind of chaotic, chaotic crazy thinking that you have here in Italy. So thank you very much for your time, and have a great conference. Thank you for having me.